Welcome. We're on panel three, uh, views from the CJA panel attorneys and district reps. I want to welcome all of you here today. Our panel participants include Scott Cameron, CJA panel attorney from the Eastern District of California. Scott Date Datton, how do you say that? Datton, yes, ma'am. Uh, CJA district representative from the District of Alaska. Darbo DiOrio, CJA. Sorry. It's two eyes, DiOrio. DiOrio. Um, CJA panel attorney from the Southern District of California, Philip Trevino, CJA panel attorney from the Central District of California, and Mark Windsor, CJA panel attorney from the Central District of California. As we get started, again, I'd remind anyone who has a cell phone, make sure that you have it off or on vibrate. And I'm going to ask each of you to make a brief opening statement. We've seen your submission. It's a very brief opening statement, and then we'll begin with questions. And we'll start with you, Ms. Dayaro. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, my name is Deborah DiOrio, and I've been uh, had the privilege of being a CJA representative for about the last quarter century in San Diego. I'd like to talk, to start off my talk, um, referring to the principles in Strickland versus Washington about evaluating what is effective representation of a criminal defendant, because I think that that discussion is very germane to the issues this committee is exploring. Significantly, in that case, the Supreme Court refused to issue specific guidelines or draft a checklist for determining what is reasonable in assessing counsel's representation. And there was a very good discussion about the pitfalls of judicial second guessing, which I think applies to our quest for funds. Uh, the quote that I want to say to you is, the Supreme Court stated, a fair assessment of attorney performance requires that every effort be made to eliminate the distorting effects of hindsight, to reconstruct the circumstances of counsel's challenged conduct, and to evaluate that conduct from counsel's perspective at the time. Because of the difficulties inherent in making the evaluation, a court must indulge a strong presumption that counsel's conduct falls within the wide range of reasonable professional assistance. And they went on to say, intensive scrutiny of counsel and rigid requirements for acceptable assistance could dampen the ardor and impair the independence defense counsel must have discourage the acceptance of assigned cases and undermine the trust between attorney and client. My segue here is probably pretty obvious. I believe these same principles and standards should apply to the CJA counsel's representation of our clients, our requests for expert witnesses, for investigative interpreter funds, for the type of services that was just testified to uh, by Mr. Aoki and his uh, compatriots in discussing what happens in these mega budget cases. That unfortunately is not always the case. In the Southern District where I practice, our bench is very different. Uh, it's, a, it's a collegial bench. Uh, people get along very well. Um, the, the attorneys are treated very well. But the judges came to the bench from very different paths. Um, they don't all share the same background, and they don't all share the same judicial philosophy, and they certainly don't all share the same attitude about funding the CJA panel. Um, in preparing for this testimony, many attorneys from my panel contacted me to talk about problems that they've had with funding. And again, I want to emphasize that these problems are not, our judges are also not a monolithic entity. Each judge approaches the case differently. But there are too many anecdotes coming from our district that evince the same sort of problems. Problems getting paid, getting uh, funds for experts. For example, expert fees are frequently slashed in half. And what the, the result of that is that you don't get as highly qualified an expert to defend your case. It frequently happens in some of the child pornography prosecutions that we have, the forensic evaluations. Um, so you, first of all, are dealing with somebody who is willing to work for well below uh, the industry standard. And secondly, those who are willing to do the CJA work are extremely busy because we have a lot of huge cases right now in which we need their services, and the turnaround time is very lengthy. So you also need a judge who's aware of that, thinks the need for the service is important, and is willing to give you the time uh, not necessarily just for you to get up to speed on the case, but for your expert to be able to conduct an evaluation and do a report. 
there are very disparate practices um, and attitudes about that in the Southern District. There are also some issues with cutting of interpreter fees and investigative fees for other matters. And then especially in these mega cases, there's a real problem getting not only the resources, the discovery coordinators, but also the time to utilize those resources. Um, I had an instance in, in uh, a case in which we were able to get a discovery coordinator. And I bring this up because I actually am in favor of the discovery coordinators. I think they're great and I think that's the way to go. But that's also not a perfect world. In my particular case, we had a budgeting attorney from the Ninth Circuit come down. We spent hours and hours developing a budget. Most of us were not familiar with how to do that. We articulated what we needed. We put together the entire budget. Um, the services were approved. And then later on, when I was trying to get my contract research attorney paid, the voucher was, uh, there was a suggested recommendation of about 40%. Now, I didn't really understand where that recommendation was coming from. I dropped the ball on doing anything about it quickly. I thought it was up in the Ninth Circuit. It turns out there were all kinds of issues that I was supposed to do rejecting the voucher. But to make a long story short, the relief that we got in that case, the, the voucher was eventually paid, came from the judge. The judge took a look at the services, took a look at the budget, took a look at what was done, and the judge said, this guy came in under budget. He was operating under the assumption that his services were all approved because they were approved not only by the Ninth Circuit budgeting attorney, but then by order of the court, and yet there was a disconnect in getting him paid. That's probably an aberrant situation, but it happened. And why those things are important is because they create a perception, which may not even be a reality, that when it comes to the CJA, you may not always get the resources that you need to defend the case. And that has a general effect on our advocacy. Now, there's an impassioned discover, d discussion going on in our district and, and probably as you've been hearing in your testimony about whether those problems and issues could be resolved by uh, having someone else evaluate whether or not services are reasonable or evaluate whether or not vouchers are reasonable. In, in our district, everything is done by the judges. There's no independent committee. Um, there, are, there are no, there's no input from anyone else. But I would imagine that our judges, I, I, I would imagine that not all of them really like doing that. I know I wouldn't like doing that. But my point is this, whatever decision is made about who should make these decisions, whether it's the judges, whether it's an independent body, what I would like to suggest is that those evaluations need to comport with due process. It's wrong to do work and submit a voucher and get no notice and open the envelope and find that your check is less than what you build and have no idea that that was coming. It's wrong not to have the opportunity to address the concerns of the judges or the evaluating committee about why you spent the time that you did without being able to rebut or address those concerns. And it is very wrong not to be able to do anything about it because there's simply no appellate process. I think at a minimum, the re there should be a presumption that our representation is reasonable and there should be a meaningful opportunity to be heard. Thank you. Mr. Dutton. Thank you. My name is Scott Dutton. I'm from the District of Alaska. I was listening to the previous speakers talking about the resources available. We've just started one of those mega cases in Alaska where I have to do the case budgeting. They asked me to take over the role as the lead attorney. We got the first bit of discovery. We had to get a terabyte hard drive and give it to the government and have that all dumped on a one big hard drive. And now we have additional discovery coming in. Now we've hired a case paralegal and I'm working with uh, Ms. Perelman here in the Ninth Circuit to work up budgets and uh, discovery, take care, try to take care of discovery issues. It's all kind of new in Alaska because we don't have a lot of these big cases. 
But the cases we do have, there's a tremendous disparity between the resources that the government can bring to bear in a case and the resources that a CJA panel attorney can respond with. Uh, there's a cap on the amount of uh, the hourly rate that a investigator or a paralegal can be paid, and uh, one must continually go go back and seek additional funds from the court. Those funds are almost always granted. Uh, the requests, I guess, are, are usually deemed reasonable in in light of the resources available, but then the payment process is extraordinarily lengthy for both the uh, service providers and the attorneys, despite the, the CME or the, the electronic billing process, it, it still has its bugs. It sometimes takes three or four or five months. For my purposes, that's not overwhelmingly important because I have a practice that allows me to not get paid for months at a time for a CJA case. But that's not always the case with the paralegals or investigators or other experts that I've had to hire and ask to work for a lower CJA rate. I guess from the perspective of panel attorneys in Alaska, what would be most important is that CJA lawyers get paid a little better. Uh, you really can't attract some of the best lawyers unless they have another another way to support themselves because frankly the 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 rate of pay is not very good in fact my office manager complains that uh, i shouldn't take any more of these cases at all i really enjoy them and i don't mind doing it but some people can't afford to or won't reduce their incomes in order to take them and given that we have a very small uh, cja panel in alaska and no end of cases. We often have to hire lawyers from the CJA panel in the state of Washington to supplement the, the panel in Alaska. So the thrust of, of my testimony today would be, yes, we want all these resources that the Defender Services can give us. We're more than willing to try to use them, but you also have to look at the individual lawyers and provide them with assistance and stop asking them to subsidize the defense of indigent defendants. Thank you, Mr. Cameron. Good afternoon, committee. Uh, again, my name is Scott Cameron. I'm the district representative for the Eastern District of Sacramento. I've been the district representative for approximately two years. Um, I've been with the CJA panel for approximately eight years. Uh, I, I know that the committee expressed an interest uh, with their invitation to discuss the uh, budgeted cases. In the Eastern District of, Sac uh, of California, we have had uh, a handful of those, but we don't have an extreme amount of experience with the budgeted cases. But I did reach out to, I had a budgeted case, one of them, and I reached out to other attorneys who had the budgeted cases and solicited some feedback. The feedback was quite ranging. The feedback ranged from uh, that the process itself was a bit cumbersome or the onerous was the word used. Uh, a, another attorney uh, had a contrary opinion and was used to submitting budget, budgets to the California Supreme Court for state death penalty cases and he found in comparison that the budgeting process was not onerous. I think one bit of unanimous feedback that I received on the budgeting cases was trying at the beginning of the case trying to forecast what the case needed. As the case progressed, the ability to forecast what would be needed improved. But I think some unanimous feedback that I received, again, was in quarters one and two, you don't really know much about the case. And those are two very important quarters to be forecasting. It, and so that was a, a bit of a challenge. There was also some concern that may have actually, may no longer be timely. Um, a lot of the attorneys in the Sacramento, uh, the Eastern District panel-wise is divided into two sections. Uh, on the northern end of the Eastern District is the Sacramento office, and in the southern end of the district is the Fresno office. Um, the, uh, uh, 
the northern part of it in Sacramento, our budgeted case, we had a budgeted case there where a lot of the attorneys were on. There was a different uh, case budgeting manager at the time. Now I understand there's a new case budgeting manager. And so I got some feedback from those uh, attorneys in the Sacramento area who felt that the case budgeting manager needed uh, a little bit more trial experience to understand what was actually needed in order to evaluate the budget. However, in speaking with uh, someone who was presently on a budgeted case and with the new case budgeting manager, they felt the person was very qualified. So I've had some ranging experiences. I think my own experience was when I when I was informed that my case would be budgeted, I did have resistance. Um, I, I uh, felt it was an, uh, an additional administrative step that I would be taking. I also felt it would maybe commit me to some rigid uh, portions of a defense that might need to be more fluid <coughs> as the case, as my understanding of the case evolved. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Windsor. Judge Cardone, committee members, thank you very much for this opportunity. My name is Mark Windsor, and I'm from Los Angeles, California, the Central District, uh, where it is my understanding mega cases were invented. Um, <laughs> and so I've done my share of them since I've been there. I've been there for about, uh, I believe, 11 years now. Before that, I was in the Northern District as a panel attorney here in San Francisco and before that in San Diego in the Southern District where I was both a federal a trial attorney at the Federal Defender's Office and after that a panel attorney there. I have taken this opportunity that you've given me to present you with a concrete example, a case in particular that I have handled that I believe exemplifies most of the things that are currently wrong with the way at least the Central District of California handles its CJA panel. For the benefit of the live stream, I'll just briefly summarize that that was a RICO murder case uh, that for a period of time commanded most of my working hours and thoughts. Um, during the course of that representation, I represented a young man who was charged with uh, a Vicar murder he was facing first the death penalty and then ultimately a mandatory life sentence, uh, which ultimately was imposed. Uh, and during the course of that representation, I submitted several vouchers. My understanding is that those vouchers were reviewed for reasonableness. I have some feedback from the CJA supervising attorney that they were carefully reviewed because at one point in time, I was contacted to provide further explanation by that supervising attorney as to why, in particular, my review of documentation uh, was uh, consuming so many work hours. I responded to that almost immediately with a detailed letter. Uh, not very long after that response, I was told by the CJ um, supervising attorney that she'd reviewed my letter, she was satisfied with my explanation, and she paid my voucher. Uh, the case continued on for about another seven months or so. At the end of the case, as is um, the procedure, I submitted a final voucher with some outstanding hours, and then uh, also a CJA 26. Um, not the form, but we now use a letter, or at that time we used a letter that we write to the supervising Ninth Circuit attorney because, of course, this was well above the uh, cap of 96 or dollars $9,900, I think it is now. Um, the supervising Ninth Circuit um, judge decided that it would be best if the trial judge took a look at my bill and in, its com in its totality to determine whether it was reasonable. Um, I was informed of this. I was told that it, there would be a review, a reasonableness review, uh, and I waited, and I waited, and uh, about five months later, I got that reasonableness review, asking, uh, determining that about half of my document review hours were excessive, and also determining that I should, uh, my total voucher should be uh, cut by in excess of $44,000. I am not alone, and I think that the committee should know this. 
Um, I, I canvassed my panel for similar stories. Specifically, I emailed them and asked them if they had, uh, for any information regarding a procedure where their final voucher was um, sent back down to the trial court for further review. Uh, I received at least 12 responses um, that detailed what had happened to them. The best case scenario in these stories were as follows. They were informed that a reasonableness review would take place. Um, they waited for that review. Ultimately, their voucher was found to be reasonable and they were paid anywhere from three months later to six months later. That's three to six months more wait time in addition to what it normally would have taken. I think this is important because that's as good as it gets. And what seems to be happening is these procedures for additional review by the trial judge appear to be taking place only when the bills are high. In other words, only where the attorney has put in a considerable amount of work. The reason I think this is important is, is that what is developing in the Central District of California is essentially a penalty for working hard on your case. You can be almost assured now, it seems, that if your bill is high by general standards or if your bill is higher than other attorneys on the case, you're pretty much guaranteed this procedure, <coughs> which, as I've stated, guarantees a three to six month wait time for your pay. And I would submit to you that payment delayed is payment reduced. This is not what I think we should be doing. It is my opinion that what's happening in the Central District of California uh, is exactly the opposite of the direction we, sh we should be taking. What is particularly disturbing by this is that I've served on two other panels. And when I first came to the Los Angeles panel, it was, it was nirvana. I mean, there was a person in charge of what we were doing, a CJA supervisory attorney, who not only appeared to have an understanding and appreciation for our work, he appeared to have the authority to make decisions on our payments. And this was critical. And when there was a problem, he would call us up or email us and we could talk to him. And we could have a rational conversation about how to handle the situation. That regrettably is no longer the case. More importantly, it is my opinion and the opinion of some others that what we are experiencing right now in the Central District is the loss of an entire generation of our best and brightest panel attorneys. The difficulty with this is it doesn't happen all at once. When a panel attorney decides he's done, and many of them have decided that, um, and this comes after a series over three to four years of a, a seeming never-ending stream of memos that come every two or three months from the CJA committee uh, implementing yet another obstacle for either payment for our defense teams or for receiving payment for our work. When this decision is made, they don't just quit. Most of us can't, especially in Los Angeles, because if you're going to provide high quality representation in a place like Los Angeles, you are required to dedicate a significant amount of time. And I would submit that really you need to do that no matter where in the country you are. Criminal defense is not a hobby. It is a calling. It is one of the highest callings in the law, and I think most of the people on our panel in Los Angeles understand that. The testimony I've heard in other panels here with CJA attorneys, clearly they understand it too. This, these policies, these obstacles, and this targeting of the hardest working attorneys on our panel is going to send us back to the good old days where it is supposed to be a hobby again. I have heard that in some of the training of new attorneys brought onto our panel, they're actually told that they should not consider this full-time employment, that they should make sure that they're only working on the panel part-time. Now, that may make sense depending on what the caseload is, depending on the types of cases you get. And certainly, when you start on a federal panel, you probably shouldn't be getting the mega cases with the, with the lead defendants. But over time, if you do this long enough, you have developed a skill, an important skill, a critical skill. You provide a service that is essential to equal justice and to respect for the law in our country. This is not something that should be part-time. It's something, ultimately, 
that you need to dedicate your legal career to if you're going to do it properly, in my opinion. These attorneys who are outraged in Los Angeles begin by taking fewer and fewer panel cases and looking elsewhere and developing a private practice. I know that this takes years. I know because I've started the process myself. This is not something you can turn around in a week and suddenly most of your cases are retained. You have to build that practice. It takes time. Many of the panel attorneys in Los Angeles, many of the very best panel attorneys in Los Angeles have been engaging in that endeavor. They are not taking cases. They are moving on. And I think the panel that spoke here before, the individual, I didn't know his name, but he talked about how good attorneys are the key to a good panel. You learn from them. It's not just training. You see them in action. You see them next to you at counsel table. You watch them as they cross-examine witnesses in trials that you're on with them. The, the damage that will be done to our panel and the damage that, if this continues, will be done nationwide to CJA panels everywhere, I don't think can be appropriately calculated. I believe it will be huge. And I believe it will set back what I believe is everybody's goal here, a truly fair system of equal justice for all for the foreseeable future. Thank you for your time and attention. I welcome your questions. Mr. Good afternoon, Judge Cardone and fellow committee members. I want to thank you also for the invitation to appear before you. I am an attorney in solo practice today. I have been on the district court's trial panel since 1990. I was originally a deputy federal public defender in the Central District of California in the mid-1980s. I left to go into private practice in 1990 and also went into teaching law. I found quickly teaching didn't really suit me. It's just easier to actually do the practice. Um, I also am on the appellate panel to the Ninth Circuit, and I also currently serve on the selection committee for Capital Habeas Council in the Central District. It's been a joy and a pleasure to work in this district for as many years as I have. I've seen a lot of changes come and go. Um, I've seen a lot of revisions, a lot of procedural changes, a lot of changes in the law. And my practice also has changed fairly substantially across those years. I was avidly and very enthusiastically a trial lawyer for quite a number of years. I carried a very heavy docket, and I loved doing trial work. But as the years continued, a number of the judges on the bench in my district began inquiring if I would accept capital habeas appointments before them. Our capital cases were coming in from the California case, uh, the California Supreme Court. And it was not an area I intended to go into, but I did, after considerable reflection, agree to do it. And so my practice has changed because I have found over the years doing capital habeas casework is really not compatible with a normal trial docket. As I've pondered how to present myself to you today, for some reason, three specific experiences I had earlier on in my career have come back to me over and again. So with your indulgence, I'd like to just tell you one scenario that I saw repeatedly when I was still a deputy federal public defender. I'd get a client, horrific fact pattern, um, look at the rap sheet. Pull your microphone I'm sorry. a little closer, I'd, please. Thank I'd you. have a new case assigned to me. I'd go through the discovery. It's a pretty overwhelmingly adverse fact pattern. I'd look at my client's rap sheet. My client had a number of priors and had invariably previously always pled guilty. I'd go to talk to my client, and as much as I loved doing trial in those days, I'd talk to the client, and I would fairly clearly, strongly suggest, this is really not a very triable case. And time and again, my client would say, you know, Mr. Trevino, I have always pled guilty before, and I'm thinking, yes. And then the client would say, but this time I'd like to have a trial. Said, Great, it's your constitutional right, let's do it. And we would, and we'd go to court, and I could see the judge was not happy that I was taking up that court's time with this particular matter. I could see the venere wasn't particularly pleased to have its time spent in this matter either. Prosecutors and agents had it in for me, and we'd go through day after day of jury proceedings, and I'd get my face rubbed into the cement, and we'd get the conviction. We'd go back for sentencing, and this was pre-guideline days, remember? And so we'd have this significant, very onerous sentence imposed. And after everything was said and done, over and over again, 
my clients would come to me and say, Mr. Trevino, thank you so very much for everything you have done for me. And I sort of was puzzled because I kept thinking, you came to me with a dog of a case. We got creamed in court. You've gotten a very lengthy sentence. What is it exactly that you're thanking me for? And it was a while before it dawned on me that my clients were thanking me because I had listened to them, because I had taken up their banner and I had stood up on their behalf in court. And it further finally dawned on me, no one in their lives had ever done that before. This was not my personal background. I was beloved as a child. I always knew my parents valued me. My family gave me a wonderful support network. But my clients had never had that. So that's actually what they were thanking me for. I want to segue to when I got an appointment in the Ninth Circuit on a habeas matter. In state court, my client had had a three-day sentencing conviction after a jury trial where he had been convicted of numerous child molest offenses. And after the, at the third day of the sentencing hearing, trial counsel tells the court on the record, Your Honor, my client would like, to be, would like to address the court now. And the state court trial judge responded on the record, Thank you, no. I don't find it's helpful to hear from the defendants. So that makes its way up to the Ninth Circuit, at which point I get appointed. I had a very vigorous argument with a panel who was very interested to know what would my client have said. And I consistently sidestepped the question. I said, I'm sorry, our record doesn't tell us. And I knew they were upset. I, didn't, I wasn't making it easy for them. But they issued a published decision holding for the first time ever that there was a federal constitutional right to allocution. So we were remanded to the magistrate court for a hearing now as to prejudice. And I got to meet my client for the first time. And my client said to me, Mr. Trevino, we can dismiss the case now. I'm shocked. I said, what do you mean? He said, that's all. I just needed somebody to say that that judge was wrong. He should have let me be heard. I said, but we're winning. No, it's OK. I'm going to go do my time. Thank you. So I stood up, and I dismissed the case, pretty much to the shock of the magistrate judge who was presiding. If you'll bear with me, I'm going to come, I hope, full circle with the third and final point. I got an inquiry from a particular district judge on a particular capital habeas matter. I hadn't wanted to take these cases, but any time a court asks me, I try to be responsive and, if possible, be there for the court. I reviewed the California Supreme Court's decision, and I was revolted. It was a horrific fact pattern. It was horrible, violent, sexual aggression, and there were several murders of very young children. I couldn't get through the legal analysis. I was stopped at the factual analysis. And I realized I had to grapple with and decide a key question that I think every defense lawyer sooner or later has to face, which was, am I going to be the kind of defense lawyer who will cherry pick clients and only take the cases I want to do, or will I truly stand up and deal with and represent any client? And I decided to take the case. My co-counsel and I went to meet our client for the first time, and he asked a question of us, one, only, one and only one question. He said, I just want to know, are you going to come and see me? Because my, appellate, my direct appeal lawyer would never see me. I said, I can't address why, what the appellate lawyer did, but let me explain. In habeas, it's a different process. We will come see you, but I don't know how often. And he said, well, you'll do it however often you think is necessary, and that's OK. I said, yes, we will but I want you to know there is a very real process and prospect as we go through this case together, you may get executed. And my co-counsel and I are human. We're your lawyers, but we are human. And the more we deal with you, the harder it may be for us sometimes to have to come and face you, but we will do what we need to do. And this man whose case so revolted me at the outset that I couldn't read the legal analysis initially, this man says to me, Mr. Trevino, if that happens, you and Mr. Brennan need to just get up and go on and be happy in your lives. I'm not here because of anything you did. And that moment, as I've thought about how to address this committee today, these three illustrations of what has been a core of my entity as a defense lawyer kept coming back to me. 
And to the best of my ability to distill it, I believe it is because I've listened to a great deal of the testimony this committee has received, and I've been extremely impressed with the breadth of it, this committee's work and the amazing effort that the various individuals who have been before you have given to their careers and their representation of, of the indigent. But I do have the perception that much, a great deal of the focus here has been on the role of the lawyer and the fiscal aspects of the administration of the act, which necessarily are very important. But I am reminded that we are not just lawyers. We are lawyers and we are counselors. And all too often I fear it's that counselor role that isn't really perceived, discussed, or very much even understood. But I think it's what gives heart to the work that we do. I think it may be at the root of much of the frustration we experience as CJA lawyers when we do feel challenged or hampered in our ability to serve our clients properly. And I know it's a big part of what keeps me going forward. I'm not sure if I can help this committee in any significant way, but it's my hope to do whatever I can. And I will welcome your questions. Thank you. All right. Um, let's start today, uh, this afternoon, with Catherine. So, Ms. Rowe. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, Mr. Trevino, I just want to say uh, I appreciated your stories. And uh, I think that the question would be whether the counselor, the time spent as a counselor, is reasonable and necessary. I think we all know it's necessary. I think the question would be is whether you, you can get paid for being reasonable, especially when we see uh, all these, uh, these cuts that go to um, client conferences. So I don't disagree with you. I'm just saying I think that's where um, we will run into trouble. So. I understand why. I believe at least I can understand how that can become a bit challenging. My expectation is most of the challenge is a question of what the perspective is Absolutely. that the reviewer has. I've heard various individuals testify before you and comment on the need for a particular type of individual in certain positions, whether we're talking about case budgeting positions or whether we're talking about other types of positions, and I couldn't agree more. Can you lead a little closer to the mic? Oh, I, yes, my apologies. I know you're sharing. Okay. I can be dense sometimes, Judge. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I think it is so important for the in individual who's doing the review to have some true comprehension of the need for these, for the need for the whole panoply of services. I am not, however, somebody who believes that there should be a great deal of time spent in these different ways, but I do believe some amount of it is at least occasionally necessary. And I do think Some truly dedicated lawyers will provide that additional service even without the compensation. But it is a little disheartened. It is disheartening if the compensation, if that type of service isn't even honored and understood as to why it, what its importance is. Have I, I understand. come back to you at all yet? I understand. Ms. Diorio, let me, let me turn to you for a minute. Um, this morning we heard from your chief judge, chief judge and I don't know if you heard his comments or his testimony this morning, but when I asked him about the issue of voucher cuts, he seemed to indicate that, as far as he knew, that wasn't a problem at all in his district. And I did mention to him that uh, we, had heard in, we had heard that it was the number one complaint of CJA attorneys. And I was obviously basing that on your, on your written statement. Can you? Tell me a little bit about that. I'm, I'm trying to understand the disconnect, if it just hasn't made its way up to the chief judge, or if there, um, if you're, I don't know if your, your federal defender is also involved, or well, I guess that would be Rufin. Um, I, I'm just wondering, how is it that he, he just doesn't know that, or your court doesn't seem to know? I think that one of the things that we need to do, uh, when we say we, I also mean myself, and uh, Mr. Khan and I may try to see Judge Moskowitz and talk to him about some of this. In my opening comments, I prefaced them by saying that there is a very large disparity between the judges and how they handle cases. It's not the nature of the bench in San Diego for 
for them to entertain complaints about their fellow judges. So if you have an issue with a voucher being cut, you would never go to another judge to complain about that. And that's because they are very independent and they do not interfere in one another's cases. Having said that, he is the chief judge and I am a member of the panel and I'm also a member of a CJ, CJA advisory committee. And I think that upon hearing his comments, it's incumbent on me and others to talk to him about that. So I think that's perhaps uh, something that we need to do better. Um, but that's the reason, is that I would never go to Judge Moskowitz, for example, to complain about something that, well, first of all, many of the things that I'm telling you are, are stories from other attorneys. They're not necessarily my stories, but I don't think anyone would ever go to another judge to complain about what happened uh, in, in a different case. So essentially you're left with anecdotal evidence and there's, there's no way you can actually gather um, information about well, other than just asking each person individually. Well, you, you could because we could, um, we could reach out to attorneys and say, can you present us with all the cases in which you've been cut? And we could give you those case numbers and you could see what was submitted on the vouchers and you could see what was ultimately paid. So there would be a way to do that if that was something that the committee was interested in. Um, I don't think that that um, problem is limited to the Southern District and I don't think the Southern District has a problem that is worse than other districts. I think it's just an issue with CJA representation. And to circle back to the, to the uh, comment that you just made about the reasonableness of meeting with clients, I have a slightly different take on that. I meet with my clients a lot and I get to know them a lot. And the result of that is generally that many of my cases with very difficult defendants settle. I am frequently appointed not as the first or even the second, but as sometimes the third attorney on difficult cases where they absolutely cannot get along with their appointed counsel. And I have had success in settling those cases which should be settled precisely because I spend the time to get to know my clients, to listen to what they have to say, and to discuss the evidence with them. And at that point, when they believe that I've listened to them, it's much easier for them to accept my statement dude, don't go to trial, you're gonna get killed. But you have to put in the time, and I don't think it's hand-holding, I think it's an essential part of providing adequate defense to my clients, and I think ultimately it saves a bundle of money. Have you had voucher cuts um, that were directed towards the amount of time that you spend conferencing with your client? I haven't had many vouchers cut. I can tell you that I have had that envelope opening experience where I was hoping that Steve Harvey was giving the envelope to Miss Columbia, not me. That's happened. But I don't know why, because there was no explanation. Uh, I, in fact, I don't even know if I would have noticed uh, the most recent one that I had, had not another attorney on that case complained, oh, my voucher got cut. And then I went back and looked at mine and thought, oh, so did mine. Um, mine w was a smaller cut, but there was no explanation provided. There was no notice uh, or any indication that there was a problem with the representation. It may be that that's why it was cut, because that case did not go to trial, but I don't know, and so I can't 100% answer your question. I know you have a, a pretty recent CJA advisory committee in your district. Is that an issue that you feel comfortable having the CJA advisory committee take up? The CJA Advisory Committee is brand new, and the purpose of it initially, as we understood it, was to make recommendations to the judges as to who should be on the panel. We have a bit of a different, uh, our, our district, the, the judges pick the panel. Uh, there is no input from anyone other than the judges. The judges make all of the decisions, and it's not something that happens um, transparently. I think in response to some of the issues uh, that have been discussed around the country, they felt that perhaps there should be some input, and so they selected a group of us. This, we've, this year, we just selected our panel again uh, in December, December 1st, and that was only the second, time, the second year that we did it. Um, now that we're getting a little more comfortable with the process, I think that uh, we're gonna try to broaden it to issues that affect the panel other than who should be on it. Thank you. Mr. Windsor, I, I wanted to ask you a question, or maybe a few. Uh, obviously, I read your materials and heard your testimony here today. Have you 
any knowledge about anyone else at the time that you received, if we will call it a clawback, at the time that you received that voucher, um, that cut, and then they wanted the money back. Had you heard of anyone else in your district having that same issue? Yes, I have. In fact, there was that issue um, in another case that happened before mine for about an equal amount, actually more. Um, in, in particularly, that case is actually more outrageous than, in, of course, I think it's outrageous, and I, I hope that many of you agree. Uh, but this case is even more outrageous than mine in that um, it was an attorney that took his case to trial in uh, a multi-defendant case that was never officially declared extended or complex, thus triggering relief from the cap. Now, even though that was never officially said, Los Angeles, pretty much every case is going to be extended or complex. There are very few cases that you're going to get that aren't going to be multi-defendant, that aren't going to last years, and that aren't going to go well above the cap. Um, so they, 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 that cap is really kind of a, it's kind of a joke in Los Angeles. I mean, it just doesn't, it doesn't accurately represent um, the average case. The average case is going to go well above that cap where we are. What happened to this particular attorney is that um, he was the only one of maybe four or five defendants, and I don't know all the details, uh, who took his case to trial. Other attorneys on that case went above the cap, but didn't go to trial. They billed 20000 30000 um, and they were paid, and there was no problem. Final, final voucher was paid. This attorney went to trial, billed $60,000, which was what that cost to do, and was paid incrementally on his vouchers. At the end of the case, he also had his bill referred back down to the trial judge by the Ninth Circuit supervising um, judge. And that trial judge said, you know, this is a pretty straightforward issue. It's, I've decided it's not extended or complex, therefore it cannot be paid above the cap. So please pay us back $50,000. And that was rubber stamped by the Ninth Circuit supervising judge. Um, this is, is just blatantly unfair. And it, it has had a tremendous chilling effect across the panel. It's been well publicized. We all know about it. I knew about it before the report came. Um, and I just can't tell you the effect that that has on all of us. The way that the Ninth Circuit judge has responded to this is to now um, put in place, just, just, just recently, just a couple weeks ago, a process by which if your case goes above the cap, as soon as it does that, you have to submit with your bill, even though it's not the final bill, it's not even close to the final bill, you have to submit a nine-page CJA 26 form. Now, I know Anthony Solis and Marilyn Bednarski are going to talk to you about this form tomorrow. Um, but it is, I've looked at it. I haven't had to fill it out. I have to fill it out very soon. My billing was actually due today. Um, but other attorneys have been filling it out. And the report that's come back is attorneys are spending 12 and 15 hours going through all their cases and filling out this nine-page form. Um, and that's so, not compensated, is that correct? Oh, uh, not compensated. You can't, you can't bill for billing. So that's lost time. It, I read your statement, but is the final result, I mean, where we're at right now, is that you have not received any relief from this, that you s still are expected to pay this money back? Well, I think it's, uh, we're kind of on new ground. I know that this other attorney who's had this cut, he's a little bit ahead of me in the process. He received um, his news from the trial judge about six or seven months before I did. Um, according to, if you look at that, the administrative opinion that keeps being cited uh, by, by, in our district, in Ray Smith, um, that's, a, that's a decision by one Ninth Circuit judge uh, responding to an appeal of a cut from a CJA attorney. Uh, that one judge opinion says, you know, under the guidelines, we're supposed to give you some process. And here's the process you've got. Trial judge makes a determination. You don't like it. It can go to the Ninth Circuit supervising judge, and then you're done. That's it. Um, I don't buy it. That's not process. So, so is that being appealed or not? 
And I said, you know, no appeal. Okay. Right. okay that's it. Well. You're, you're done. You're out. Um, fortunately, we have organizations like the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers um, who have worked with this attorney and is, in fact, working with me now to obtain pro bono counsel so that we can all spend our time, instead of representing our clients, figuring out how we're going to carve some sort of meaningful process out of this. Um, so no, it's not over. Um, and I will say, actually, I have yet to receive a letter that I'm supposed to receive saying, give us the 44 grand. That hasn't happened yet. It could happen any day. Have you received anything addressing the actual issues you raised, you know, some of the issues that you have raised that um, one of the attorneys who had similar hours, to, similar discovery review hours to you, had put them in a different category, or another person had had a lower number of discovery hour, review hours because he was the second lawyer on the case, things like, things like that. Have you received any answer that addresses those issues? I've received an answer of a fashion. I've received the answer of uh, the trial court issuing a denial of my, um, my detailed letter of reconsideration. And in that letter, which took weeks to craft and took uh, the patience of, of a few of my colleagues to help me with, um, you know, we went through that very carefully. We went through the scenario. We looked at the documents. I had my paralegal put in more hours on my own dime to look through the documents and go through it. And I paid her directly out of my pocket. I'm not going to see that money. Um, and, and she did a great job, as she did during, during the, the case itself. Um, but we, the issues I raised, the merits of my petition for relief, have never been addressed. They were not addressed in the trial judge's denial. He simply listed, I read these documents. Um, the, the, the petition for relief is denied. Uh, the Ninth Circuit judge simply said, Interestingly, the Ninth Circuit's email, and it was an email, said, I've read the trial judge's report. He doesn't even say he read my letter. Uh, maybe that was just an oversight. I assume he did read it. Um, I agree with the trial judge, uh, denied. That's the extent of the process that I've received. It appears to me from this record, and you have these documents, that there has been no meaningful review of the trial judge's um, decision in this case. Thank you. Judge Giraud. All right, very well. Um, I've got a couple or three uh, areas. And, uh, one of them is timely payment, which I don't particularly understand, but I've heard from three of you. Uh, I believe, and I'll start with you, uh, uh, Mr. Datton, uh, you said that the payment process uh, in the uh, Alaska district is lengthy. Most, was it most of the time or often four to five months? It's usually at least that long, yes. And, and you have electronic filing there? Is yes. We, okay. we were one of the pilot programs for electronic okay. filing. Is there, any, is there any reason? Let me ask you this. Are those for just exceeding the statutory cap cases or all cases? Primarily for exceeding statutory cap cases, which happens probably 50% of the time. All right. Uh, so the, other, the other ones are probably done in two or three months uh, once once submitted to the, once submitted electronically. All right. Uh, and, and no, no, has that been, uh, has that been raised with the panel? Has it been raised with whom? I, I'm sorry, with, with the panel review process, the CJA panel. Yes, I, we have, uh, inter it's interesting you bring up the, the uh, we have a uh, advisory committee as well, and it, in, in part in response to what other people have said, our advisory committee is actually the appeal forum for voucher cuts in Alaska. And uh, it's usually resolved in that way. If the, if, the, if the voucher is cut by the district court judge who reviewed it, then the district court judge ref ref first gives the attorney the opportunity to respond and then refers it to the advisory committee to review. Okay. Uh, and yes, the panel, the entire panel in Alaska is concerned about the length of time it takes to get paid. All right. Uh, Miss, uh, thank you. Miss uh, DiOrio, um, you have indicated that you've had uh, voucher cuts 
I, I have to say that I've been fortunate to have few of the voucher cuts, but I'm speaking on behalf of the many people who have. And, uh, uh, and as to yours, there was no reason given and no either notice or opportunity to be heard? That's correct. All right. You consider that to be a problem? I consider it to be a huge problem. I mean, we already work at a legally discounted rate. We do what we do because we believe in it. We're passionate about the defense of our clients. We are here to defend their constitutional rights. And it's beyond ironic that when it comes to our compensation for that, which is already low, we don't have any of those rights. I, I find that to be wrong. All right, and you're on the advisory committee? Is I am. Okay, and has that been raised? No, again, uh, as I had commented before, this is just our second year in it, and we were primarily, we viewed our, our mandate primarily to make recommendations about who should be on the panel, which is a separate concern because, again, there's no transparency in that process. Um, but when we heard about this ad hoc committee and some of the issues that were being raised, we have discussed amongst ourselves whether or not this might be a good opportunity to try to broaden. The, the actual order says that we are allowed to discuss any matter that, that uh, affects the CJA panel, so I think it is within our purview to do it. Okay, again, systemically, it, you'd also testified, I believe, to, there's been cuts on interpreter fees? Yes. In the and investigative fees and expert fees. Based on what? Based on the number of hours or the hourly fee or what is the basis given? The stories and there's, there are anecdotes. The anecdotes I received were that they just received uh, word back that the order would be denied but that it would be approved for half the service, for half the uh, amount that was requested. For interpreter services? Um, I've, I heard that that happened for interpreters uh, services, for expert services, and for investigative services. That experience I do not personally have, but that's what I've been told. Okay, very well. Um, all right, Mr. Uh, Trevino, uh, you're in the same district as uh, Mr. Uh, Windsor, uh, obviously, and we've, uh, we've read uh, most of your submissions and, and heard your testimony. Um, you said you have uh, seen changes uh, over the year. You're on the panel selection committee, is that right? I'm on the habeas, uh, the habeas capital okay. habeas selection right. committee. I'm not on the uh, trial panel but selection committee, but I am on the trial panel. But I should clarify, Your Honor, I don't take ordinary trial appointments at this time. I only take appointments as coordinating discovery attorney. Okay. But I have continuously been a member of the trial panel now um, since 1990, I believe it is. One of the things that Mr. Windsor testified that was most concerning uh, to him was that uh, the Central District is losing uh, some of the uh, uh, best panel attorneys. Has that been your observation? I am very saddened to report that, yes, I do share that perception. It's, um, it has been the case now for a number of years, it seems, that morale is a particularly low point with panel members. What I tried to convey in my written testimony, if I may touch on again here, when I reached out to our panel for input in anticipation of my appearance here, I got back a lot of different types of feedback, some of which were very granular, um, points that I believe this committee has already heard and is hearing again today, with regard to voucher cuts and delays in payment and uh, difficulties getting orders allowing the use of certain types of experts and so forth. What struck me, and I think those are all very important points, um, but what struck me most in the feedback that I received from my colleagues on the panel, I heard from those lawyers in particular who are even more senior than I, and in particular lawyers for whom I have a great deal of respect because I have worked alongside them for many years, including when I was doing trials, and I work with them still even now, sometimes when I'm reviewing an appellate record from a matter they've handled or when we're just as colleagues brainstorming on a legal issue or whatever, but it, these are lawyers for whom I have a high degree of regard. And a number of them came back to me and said they no longer trust their own judgments, that they are of the perception that they are being reviewed in so many different ways, that their judgments as to what is appropriate in terms of how they handle their representation has been challenged to the point that they will second guess themselves and decide to forego a motion, not because they're convinced that the motion isn't appropriate, but because they believe that their decision to present such a motion will be challenged. Or if they make the motion, bill for the time, their compensation 
will later be challenged. That's possibly what I find most disturbing. Um, it's that, and then there are those lawyers along the line who have also left across the years. I'm hesitant to say that they have left necessarily because of these concerns, because I know we always have some degree of attrition on our panel. It's been going on for a long time. But it does seem like it may be happening more now than it had previously. Um, I certainly hear people talking about their intent to leave. I believe them to be honest when they say it. I'm not sure that it is always followed up with the actual decision to leave. Mr. Windsor's accurate. There's a lot of complications and a lot of additional work that has to go into transitioning one practice. So it might be that that's, that in the heat of a moment they'll make this statement, but not necessarily follow through with it. But I do believe since the era of the, um, my memory just blanks, I want to say attrition and that's not right, our sequestration. I always thought the word was a little odd in that context, but the, since the era of sequestration is when we began to see a, a marked change. And I know that there were huge forces um, operating against all of the nation at that time, but it seems some of those perhaps really hit the judiciary and the CJ in particular. I, I and, guess that, and that'll be my last question, is that is there, a, we're not from California, um, is there, well, is, is, there any, is there any context that, that you wish to, I mean, th has this just happened out of the blue over the last two or three or four or five years, or is there any it's context been, that the committee should know? It's been ongoing. Um, I do think that Mr. Windsor is accurate when he points out that the predecessor, as the supervising CJA attorney, was more effective in terms of helping provision the panel with what it needed. Um, I am not able to tell this committee why he is no longer in that position, but he is not. Um, my fundamental takeaway from all of this is, I'm going to backdrop for just a second, if I may, historically. I remember when all CJA vouchers were processed by the individual presiding judge. I also remember, as an illustration during that era, writing a check for roughly $10,000 to photocopy the record in a capital case. And I was working full bore on that case at the time because I had imminent deadlines coming up, and a district court judge who had asked me to take the case and with whom I had always enjoyed a very good rapport, and I had no reason to believe anything had changed, but on his own, he decided to stop paying everybody in his court. So court interpreters, uh, court reporters, anybody who received funds under the CJA, including me, I was asking for reimbursement on my $10,000 check for the photocopying. None of us got paid. I ended up taking a writ of mandamus against him at the Ninth Circuit, and I went to our CJA judge at the time, and I complained, and she just kept telling me, Phil, calm down. I'm taking care of it. I kept thinking, you don't understand. I can't pay my bills. And she just kept saying, calm down and I should have trusted her. Because sure enough, a couple of weeks later, we learned that she had in fact been successful with Congress in negotiating the appropriations that allowed our district to have the pilot program of the first supervising CJA attorney in our district. And that removed the voucher authority from all of the individual district judges and put it in the hands of that individual in the CJA supervising attorney's office. I remember what it was like dealing with the individual judges. I think that was a far worse system. I think we have come a long way, but I do not think we have a perfect system. And I think, unfortunately, we have made some slide, we have been sliding back lately. But I'm telling you that based on my overall perception of what I have seen now for quite a number of years, there's only one answer. And I think that is, this all needs to be taken out of the judiciary's hands. There needs to be some separate entity created that does the voucher review, the compensation, the authorization for ancillary services, because there have been so many different types of tensions over the years. And I, don't th and I think we're all losing energy and time on something that could very thoroughly and correctly and appropriately be delegated to a, a completely different entity. I've been very frustrated, and I'm going long, I hope Your Honor will indulge me just a moment more, 
I have been repeatedly disappointed in the testimonies when your honors have asked, the committee has asked for the different witnesses before it, what the individuals here would suggest to you. If you were going to make a recommendation, what alternative? And to my ear, at least time and again, there hasn't been an answer forthcoming. And I find that disappointing. And I'm afraid I'm not going to be much better on that. I gave you, well, I've been cracking my head on this thinking. I give you one little suggestion. I don't think it's a perfect one, but in my written testimony, I referenced the California Pellet Projects. I only dabble occasionally in those matters. I have an overwhelmingly and have always been a federal practitioner, but I do occasionally do a state appeal. And my, doing my bill in that takes three, five minutes maybe. Bang, it's done. Doing bills in the, in the federal world is a major endeavor, and it's become more and more time draining, and it's become more frustrating, I think, for all of my colleagues as I hear their stories come to me at least, that they don't get the reimbursement they seek. And I hope I've answered your question, Your Honor. I want to hear from Mr. Windsor, and my, and my question was context, and, and yes. you know, was, was there something the California courts were... Uh, Speaking of were, the Central District in particular, I can tell you that um, right about the time of the sequester, there was an audit performed um, by the new CJA chair, I think, and that committee, and I think uh, some Ninth Circuit judges got involved. There were, I think, about five panel attorneys in the Central District that had what appeared to be irregularities, I, I assume. Um, I don't know the backstory so much. I do know that we were all brought into a courtroom and presented with the data. Uh, one of these attorneys had billed more than 24 hours in a day. Uh, one of them, uh, their yearly billing would indicate that they'd billed eight hours a day every day for 365 days. Um, so there were clearly irregularities. There were things that... So, so there were, at, at least the Central District was... Resp I mean, there is some context to it. The Central District was attempting to, yes. to respond to something to in, in place in new procedures or rules. Is that yes, and that, that is the stated... Uh, um, I want to say uh, genesis of all okay. that has come since then. Essentially, we've been painted with the same brush, um, and, and I find that uh, disturbing. Uh, I find okay. it upsetting, and many of my colleagues do as well. Um, okay. In other words, there was a, gr a group of what, a five or, or whatever. And I, I don't even remember the yep. number. There was a. We have like 130 attorneys on our on our panel, um, and and this was the first time I'd ever heard of a clawback of saying to somebody, we paid you, but we've now figured out that that was an error and you have to pay us back. And, and all of these attorneys agreed to do it um, for whatever reason. And I, I, I can't say that I have any inside information on, on what those reasons would have been. Um, but for me personally, I've been doing this 18 years and I've gone back over the bills that I can go back over. I've never been significantly cut ever until now. And in this case, the most significant cut, I've, so as far as I recall, to the data that I have, I don't know, you know if there's something back there 12 years or something. Um, in this particular case, I was cut $2,000 for an expense, not for time. Now, I've been cut a couple hours here and there. That happens. And that's, you know, that's going to happen. And I'm fine with that. That's, that we, let me, and let me be clear. The panel needs oversight. Absolutely. The, the panel that you had here today earlier, by the way, I was able to listen to it, the budgeting attorneys. I, was, I found that fascinating, and I found that compelling testimony. And um, I would echo um, Peter Shaw, who, by the way, is very well respected in the legal community in Los Angeles. And the reason he is is he's fair, he, he's direct, he makes decisions, and those decisions are given credence and authority. And that's the key. Because no matter who you start out with in a supervisory position, uh, it does, I mean, they should know what they're doing. I mean, save us all the headache of having somebody do this who has never practiced criminal defense, because it's going to be a headache. And it's going to take years for them to get educated. But even if you do that, they're going to get educated. And if you deal with the same person who is the center point of CJA um, funding, and that person has independence and authority, and hopefully experience, um, that's going to be a huge benefit right off the bat uh, because 
Everyone's going to be going to know who they're dealing with. They're going to know what to expect. That person will be a professional. That person can look at the funding situation with an eye towards high quality representation and nothing else. And that's what they should be looking at. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I've gone astray. That's fine. But so from my context, I, I'd never heard of a clawback since then, uh, um, and now this is, this is happening in very recent months. This is a new development. It appears to be a new approach. Um, from what I've heard from other panels, it also appears uh, to have happened elsewhere. So this may be coming to uh, a panel near you. I think it's very disturbing, as I've already said. All right. Thank you, Judge. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Friendsley, you're up. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fina has set the table, um, and so I want to ask the question of the panel. Is there anybody on this panel who would make the argument that the current system is great, Judicial involvement is the way we need to go. No change needs to be made. Anybody want to carry that banner? I know, Mr. Cameron, you, you referenced in your written materials your personal belief that the system was, I think, awkward was the term you used, but you acknowledged that you had come across some panel attorneys or district panel reps who thought it wasn't a bad idea because of familiarity with the case. One, one, uh, I did reach out also and canvas my panel and certain attorneys, especially ones that I know to have, that are quite opinionated. One, I was surprised by that. I did include that in my written testimony. He valued the fact that the person reviewing his claim for compensation was familiar with the complexity of the case and had seen what was going on in the case with that particular client. Um, but I included that to be, you know, fully, full disclosure. Sure. I do find it awkward, uh, as well as I think the majority of uh, attorneys who, a lot in, in my particular district, a lot of the attorneys from this on the CJA panel started in a state indigent defense panel. Uh, became proficient at trial work and then began CJA panel work. But in that state experience, there is this separate entity that Mr. Uh, Trevino was speaking of that reviews the claim. Uh, and, and so it seems awkward because, you know, you want to justify why some additional time was taken to speak to a difficult client. Uh, a client who was, uh, you know, uh, somewhat obstructive. But you don't want to use that language with the judge who's presiding over the case, you know. So, yes, I, did, I do find it awkward, and I feel that, that the majority of, uh, of attorneys who started in the state system find it awkward. But you're right, there in, was a... In the context of that type of review in the state system that you're referring, is, is the standard the same? Is it a reasonableness review, or is it some other standard? In terms of at the, in the other panels, the state panels, is that what you're Yes, asking? yeah. yeah. Uh, well, um, there is a, a, a reasonableness review by, by the other panels. So, for instance, uh, Mr. Trevino mentioned the uh, California appellate system. I'm also a member of the Central California Appellate Program, which handles... Uh, a band of uh, the third district court of appeal for the state of California and the fifth court of, district court of appeal for the state of California, and that project has a staff attorney who is assigned as a staff attorney for my case. So if I have a particular problem with the case, I can consult with him. But they also review my bill. They do a, perform a reasonableness review, and will cut my bill if necessary, but they also have a pretty stringent set of guidelines that work with like reviewing 50 pages per hour or and the, the body of the brief being three times as much time as the statement of facts, but those kind of work better in an appellate arena. They don't think those guidelines will work well when you have a variety of, of federal cases like immigration cases or wiretap cases or mortgage fraud cases, they all have different endeavors. But I think that the separate entity concept is important. 
Has anybody ever given any thought to whether or not reasonableness is the appropriate standard that should be used for reviewing, or if you think maybe there should be something different? You know, there have been, uh, since we've gone to the e-voucher system, it's a lot easier for the judges to um, do reviews, like let's say they want to look at 1326 cases, which are now amongst the most difficult litigious cases we have. But there's a wide gamut on those. Some people plead out to a fast track. It's very inexpensive. Some people litigate 1326D challenges, maybe go to trial to preserve that. But they've come up with these averages on what's an average case. First of all, we don't know what the averages are. But secondly, the idea of an average case is abhorrent because there's no such thing as an average defendant. And that really impacts the way that you defend a case. Your, your defendant, the person that you have, whether he has mental health issues, whether she has an abusive background, all of those things impact how you deal with that case, how you deal with the sentencing issues, how you negotiate. So the idea that there's an average case and that someone's bill is going to be scrutinized and it doesn't fit into the average and might be cut, I, I find to be very problematic. Going back to your comment about um, does anyone agree that having the, individual, having the individual judges is not a problem, well, let me say this. I don't know any federal judges. I know some magistrate judges, and I'm sure there are some, but I don't know very many federal district court judges who came up through the panel. Let me ask you, what, while you're um, thinking about this, um, don't you think that the idea of averaging, case averaging, is contradictory to the idea that the judge should be making the decision because the judge knows so much more about the case than anybody else does? I actually find both of those concepts a little bit troubling. Um, on the one hand, the judge does, as um, Mr. Cameron said, the judge does have the uh, familiarity with the case that perhaps another reviewing person wouldn't have. But they also see things through their own lens. So if I'm filing a motion, for example, attacking statements, and I'm trying to preserve something, or I'm trying to prove to my client, hey, I heard what you said about the way that you were treated post-arrest by the agent, and so I don't know that we have a chance of winning this, but you have a real issue with the way your statements were taken, I'll file a statements motion. There are some judges who may think, that was the most ridiculous motion, I can't even believe you filed that, and you know, you build X, Y, and Z. I don't Putting myself in the point of view of the judge, I can understand why they think that, but it, it may be because, again, those judges don't have the experience of representing criminal defendants, and they don't always realize what needs to be done. Um, we, we used to have motion hearings uh, all the time, and we used to have settlement conferences with the judges, and sometimes I, I had one case where we had a motion hearing, and my district court judge uh, in denying a checkpoint motion, took judicial notice of the fact that my client was Hispanic. Well, he happened to be African American. And my guy was tugging on my sleeve, get me a deal, get me a deal. And having that motion hearing and having him see that perhaps things weren't going to go the way he thought they, they would go helped to settle the case and avoid a trial. So there's many, many different examples of things that we do as defense attorneys that may not be obvious to people who don't share our experience. And there's no rancor involved, but so if given the choice between multiple decision makers who may or may not have any background or experience in criminal defense work versus a centralized uh, individual uh, with that kind of background, would you have more confidence in one over the other in terms of the ability to review a voucher? That's kind of a Hobbesian choice. We've got to get somebody who doesn't have any criminal defense <laughs> experience scrutinizing our vouchers or the judge. No, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I said somebody who does have criminal experience, oh. background experience. I think that having either, and I know um, I've spoken about it to Mr. Kahn, and the Federal Defender's Office wants no part of it, um, but I think that there are some jurisdictions, and, and they don't have the resources for it. They're very busy. They do a lot of great stuff for us, so I would not want to put that on them. But I think that having people who are familiar with not only criminal defense, but panel work is critical in evaluating the, judge, in, in evaluating the, the vouchers because it's not all the same. It's not the same. I was a, a federal public defender under Judy Clark. What we did in that office and what, how I worked and how I did my cases, um, we didn't have the same type of billing and we didn't have the same type of concerns. They're not the same.
you um, said that, that uh, voucher cutting was the biggest concern in your district. And I think through the conversation, it appears that that's a product of the judicial involvement. So if not the judges, then who? Have you thought about that? And have you thought about your own suggestion for an alternative? We have. And again, I, I just need to reiterate, it's the biggest problem, but it's not across the board. It's not an across the board problem, and it doesn't happen to everybody. But when it does happen, it spreads through the CJA panel like wildfire because it's a fear. It's a perception that we have. So have I thought about it? Yes. Uh, I cannot speak for everybody. Sure. I do think that some of the things that I've heard about how other districts handle it by they have a, a, a committee or they have different people that are, that are on it. Again, speaking to who chooses the panel. The judges have to be involved in those kinds of decisions. They have to have some involvement in the process. They see the lawyers. They, they, they see issues that we don't know about. But I don't know that they should be the only, the final arbiter. So uh, I would like to see more input. Mr. Dutton, I just want to ask one question, given the um, logistics of the District of Alaska. Um, you sort of necessarily are confronted with issues of remote detention. And I'm curious if, to what extent um, there have been any issues with regard to compensation for travel expense, windshield time, that sort of thing, um, and um, whether or not the, the involvement of the judges in that process is in any way is adversely affecting the representation. For years, there was inadequate housing for federal defendants in Alaska, and we had to travel to SeaTac, to Seattle, to see our clients, and the judges were very good about providing those travel authorizations. They liked it better if we tried to see two or three clients at a time than if we just saw one. Now there's been a new prison built about 200, 150 miles from Anchorage that has created some extra bed space that the state will lease to the federal government. And uh, out-of-state travel is significantly less, but the drive, especially depending on conditions, can be pretty terrible. Again, the judges understand that. The primary problem we have with no federal facilities in Alaska is the inability to provide electronic discovery to our clients because the computers, the, the facilities and the state facilities are very old and we get, we get things in a variety of formats. Some, it seems like there's a different format in electronic discovery from every agency and it's, it's hard enough with a relatively new computer to keep up with all the different formats take it to the jail and they can't deal with it at all. Uh, often uh, the defendants don't get to see it unless we take our own computers to the jail, get permission from the Department of Corrections, another hassle that has nothing to do with the federal judge, uh, and try to review discovery with them on personal devices in the visiting rooms in the state facilities. So right now, reviewing discovery is a much bigger problem than travel, even though travel used to be a bigger problem than reviewing discovery. Judge Walt. Uh, Mr. Lawyer, you raise uh, an interesting issue. Uh, having done defense work early on in my career, I have some appreciation of the importance of maintaining a positive relationship with your client. But if you had a situation where your client was insisting that you file what you thought from your legal perspective was a frivolous motion, but you felt nonetheless that you had to file that motion in order to maintain that positive relationship with your client, would you file the motion? And if you file the motion, would you expect to be compensated for it? If the motion was really frivolous and there have been a few that have been suggested to me by my clients, I would not file it. Um, I have had that conversation with clients and they've come up with some street motions or motions that they've heard about and I have simply refused to file those motions. So no, I would not file a motion that I believe to be utterly frivolous. Anybody feel any different about that if you felt that the motion had to be filed in order to appease your client in order to maintain that relationship with him or her? 
Um, I try to, uh, when these situations have, ar have arisen, I have tried to explain to my clients that there are other better motions to be filed in their case, and I direct their attention specifically to those and say, you know, look, that's, that has no chance of succeeding. I don't think that that's the way to go, but let me tell you about something that I do think has uh, possible merit, and what do you think about, and then we discuss what, whatever it is, and they, when they um, see that I've thought about their case, have some suggestions. Um, most of those, in virtually every one of those cases, they've been able to switch gears and to follow my advice. So I, I haven't, I don't believe that I've ever filed an utterly frivolous motion, and I don't intend to. What if it's not utterly well, frivolous? It has some level of, of legitimacy, but you think you're not going to be able to win was, am I going to get win the motion? <laughs> there, there are a lot of motions I'm not filing. Sometimes I do it to preserve appeal. Um, sometimes I do it for uh, because I believe that there is actually a right that sh that needs to be vindicated. But that is winning. I, that's not my standard. Uh, Judge, um, I just chime in on that a little bit. I agree with everything that Ms. Diorio has said, um, except that I just want to clarify, um, when I think of a frivolous motion, I think of, you know, something that might, usually it's something my client may have heard inside. Um, this is the law now. File this, and this will happen. Then I have a long talk with my client, or hopefully a short talk with my client, and we, and we work it out. However, um, just because the law just because there's a solid wall of authority against the position, that doesn't mean I would consider it frivolous. Uh, one of the advantages to federal defenders of San Diego when I was there, and I'm sure when Ms. DiOrio was there, is we all had to do our own appeals. That was required at the time. Um, and I can think of at least two cases, one of which is actually published that I had, um, where uh, there was um, a plain error review. I'd actually inherited the case. Uh, and the law had completely changed on the issue. And the only way to see that coming was, you know, from our perspective, obviously that prior decision was erroneous. It failed to take into consideration certain realities that made it unfair. And ultimately, uh, to the credit of our case law, uh, that worked itself out. But um, there are f frivolous motion, what one judge could easily see as frivolous, just because there is authority against it. Um, I mean, this is part of the problem with having judges review vouchers, is we're going to have very fundamental differences of opinion as to what exactly frivolous means. So if you had, uh, Mr. Windsor, the ability to totally revamp the system in order to make it as fair as possible with the appreciation that Congress is going to impose some level of oversight and accountability since you're talking about uh, the appropriation of public funds, what would that system look like? Thank you very much for asking me that question. I meant to actually make a few statements in my opening about it, and I guess I got carried away, and I just didn't, didn't get there. Um, specifically, and, and I've listened to a lot of the testimony on this, as I'm sure is no surprise, the most important characteristic would be independence and authority, and if not complete independence from the court, then a significant degree of deference from the court. Uh, in my written comments, I just want to modify one thing. I think at the end there, I said um, the trial judge should have no input whatsoever in the decision of vouchers. Um, but I have listened to some of the other testimony from people far more knowledgeable and thoughtful, and we've had time to really think about this uh, in this committee. And I would say that, you know, realistically, it is going to sometimes be appropriate for the decision maker, the reviewer of a bill, if there's a question, to consult the trial judge. That makes perfect sense. And I don't think there's any problem with that. I don't think there's any problem with consulting a judge because there clearly are things that that trial judge is going to know that few other people are going to know. Where the problem is, is whether that opinion of the trial judge is taken into consideration by somebody who is independent with complete authority to make the decision, or whether that trial judge has the authority to decide how much a lawyer in front of him gets paid. Okay. 
Mr. I hope that, I hope that's your question. Mr. Dadden, you uh, indicated that the pay uh, is too low, and I may agree with that. Uh, what would you think the amount of pay in Alaska should be in order to attract uh, people to the uh, panel and to uh, retain good lawyers on the panel? There are good lawyers on the panel, and they're working for far too little money. Uh, some of the best criminal defense lawyers in Alaska probably won't take CJA cases unless the pay is raised to at least $250 an hour. And I'm talking about uh, two uh, former U.S. attorneys, for instance, who are on the panel, won't take the cases because they're working for law firms and uh, their firms won't let them work for $129 an hour. And there are uh, at least 10 very good criminal defense lawyers who just refuse to take appointments because of the, the combination of the rate of pay and the amount of work it takes to adequately document the vouchers in order to get paid at the end of a case. I don't know what the uh, cost of living is in Alaska, but for example, I'm sure the cost of living, for example, in West Virginia or at the college is very different than what it is in Washington, D.C. Should there be a location adjustment? I think there was when I first took a federal appointment in Alaska. I, I recall that, that there was. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know quite how to answer that. The, that would just, uh, that might create a whole new list of difficulties uh, for Congress or for whoever had to administer that sort of cost of living. I know that federal employees get a now a 23% cost of living allowance for working in Alaska. So in addition to whatever the, it was 25%, but it's gone down incrementally. I know that the U.S. attorney, you know, assistant U.S. attorneys get their base pay plus a cost of living allowance. Federal defenders get their base pay and a cost of living allowance. And uh, that's not reflected in payments for panel attorneys. Thank you. If I could follow up on uh, Judge Walton's last question. We've got people from around the circuit here. Uh, what about the cost of living, the hourly rates in Los Angeles, San Diego, other places? Uh, what should the hourly rate be in those districts? Should it be adjusted or should it be $250 an hour like has been suggested for Alaska or what? I, don't, I would love to, to ask for $250 an hour, but I don't think that that, uh, I don't think that that is going to pass. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest it. One comment that I did want to make, I don't know, our, the, there's a, a mileage allowance that uh, fluctuates sometimes depending on, I, I assume, the price of gas. People here in California, um, I know that we pay quite a bit more than people in other parts of the country. I don't know whether that that there is an, any adjustment for that. So again, these these differences in region, I don't know whether they're uh, accounted for right now or not. I would definitely suggest a raise from $129 an hour to $175 an hour. I think that would be fine. And when you, it, it would be very easy, should the panel ever want it to, um, I, I graduated from law school in 1988 and I have litigated, I can't even tell you how many trials since then. If I were to go into private practice in a litigation firm, I think that I would probably be compensated upwards of $600 an hour based on my experience and my litigation um, experience. But we're not in this for that. Uh, we're, we're not there's no criminal defense attorney that I know of who works for the CJA or even who works for federal defenders that is in this to get rich. Um, but it would be nice to have more adequate compensation. I think Ms. DiOrio makes a, a critical point. We're clearly not, we're either not in this for the money or we're all fools because it's not going to happen. I don't think it's so important what the hourly rate is, although I think it should be raised. Let me tell you what my real issue is. And I don't understand 
quite the system, but it, it, it appears to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that this Congress, the Congress of let's shut down the federal government, has authorized me to receive $144 an hour. Someone in the judiciary, the one sector of the entire human population that should understand and value my work, has said, whoa, don't give these people that much money. We're just going to give them $129. That's the issue. The issue is respect. Because, and, and this is really the issue in the Central District of California. That's the key issue. We're not sitting around wishing we could make more money. Um, we're sitting around knowing, those of us who have done this long enough, we know that if we're not respected, our clients will never be. Their rights will never be. And we will never achieve the goal of high quality representation and equal justice. That's the issue. The issue is not, in my opinion, respectfully, that's the core issue. We've been authorized for a higher rate. It is outrageous to me that the judiciary is the one that's lowering that hourly pay. I don't understand it. Now, maybe I'm just, maybe there's something I don't get, uh, and, I, and I'd love to hear about it. But from my perspective, that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing judges or the judiciary or the administration within the judiciary keeping us from getting paid more money. I don't understand that. It's a quick question. Were you, were you the person who testified about a nine-page form that you have to fill out? Is that you? Yes. 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 Could you tell us, I mean, what's, what's, without going page by page, what's on this form? What do you have to fill out? Like, what information do you have to provide? Uh, you have to, uh, have you seen this form? Okay. I'm, I'm going to. The, the form has been submitted. I'm, I'm, yeah, the the committee copy. has the form as one of the it's submissions. I apologize, I didn't hear you. Just summarize it just real quick. You are basically asked to break out a lot of the data from the, pre, from the overall billings of the case, or the billings that have occurred to date, and um, give a justification for the various types of services that are rendered. I have not personally filled out the form because I don't do that work at this point, but the frustration level is very high among my colleagues who are filling out the form. They are finding it extremely tedious and time consuming and extraordinarily frustrating. Um, I, I, I'm going to defer, though, to Ms. Bednarski and to Mr. Solis, who will be testifying before the committee tomorrow. That's one of the items on their presentation. If I may take a moment, too, to join with Mr. Windsor and the others on, on this side of the bench, um, I agree the rate should be increased, whether it's an increase to the 144 that's been authorized by Congress or to the ideal of 175. I'm happy with either of those things, but I would home in more on just simply certainty of payment, that under whatever the rate is, if we are paid promptly, if we are paid in a respectful manner, if our, our professional integrity is on the line every time we sign a voucher. And I take that duty very seriously. I'm an officer of the court. If I represent that I've done this work, it's because I've done it. And I guess I just would ask, as Mr. Windsor does also, for their respect in getting the compensation. I don't do this for the, for the work. I don't, excuse me, I don't do this for the money. Um, I would be in a different line of work altogether. But I'm happy here. I would be happier if the paychecks were a little bit more predictable. If I could just, I assume that one of the questions we would be asked would be, is there any empirical data that would su support the proposition that a higher rate of pay would, would improve the quality of representation. What would your response be if asked that question? The deafening cheers that my colleagues would ring in my ears would suggest that yes, you would get um, a higher morale, a greater willingness to ex take on the duties and responsibilities that these appointments call for from us. Has a study been done to show that, Your Honor? No, not that I'm aware of. Um, any augmentation in our pay that I could envision from on CJA work is never going to rise to the level of the open market value for our work. It's just not going to happen. And I think all of us understand that. But it is disappointing and frustrating to see the resources that are mustered for other functions, and specifically right now I'm thinking of DOJ. The abilities that they do have to litigate matters and that we're not put on par with them. 
that we're not enabled at least to go forward confident and with the tools we need to represent our clients to be able to get experts. If I may trouble the committee for just a moment, I had an expert testify in a capital habeas matter in district court. The presiding district judge was mesmerized for hours while this particular individual testified. She was phenomenal. She agreed to the fraction of her normal professional rate, which I think was maybe $700 at the time. She agreed to do the work for the 250 that the Ninth Circuit would authorize. I got relief from my client. I, I have no doubt that it was based on her testimony. And then because of the busy schedule she had, she didn't get her bill in in what the presiding judge thought was a timely fashion. So she never received any payment. I went back to the judge, who's an individual I highly respect. He, he had given me a magnificent decision on my client's behalf based on this expert's testimony. And that expert had never got any compensation. How mortifying for me to go and deal with her in her professional capacity and explain to her, I'm so sorry, you're not getting any money at all. She stumbled. She should have gotten her bill in earlier. But there was no question. Everybody knew she had testified. Everybody knew the work she had done. And I have to say, I think it was really clear how impressed the judge was with her. But how can an expert like that ever be expected to come back and do the kind of public service again for the court that she did in that case? So I, I, it's, again, not so much perhaps the money, but I always see the frustration. Do we know that the system's going to function and that people are going to be paid? So the 129, I'll take it. I'm not thrilled with it, but I understand it. The 144 would be, I think, more respectful. The 175, frankly, would be very nice. Can I just follow that up with a question? Did, did the judge ever explain to you, was the answer His just late? His explanation was that the request for compensation was tardy, and it was. And uh, how and late was it? Do you remember? I'm sorry? How late? I don't recall precisely, Your Honor. I, I'm thinking on the order of eight to ten months after the hearing. Okay. But this was a matter that was pending in district court for 17 years before I got relief. It was okay. a very long, complicated matter. And so when we finally got into our, our actual evidentiary hearing, there had been massive litigation that had gone on prior to that. Okay. Professor Bull, did you have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. You wanted to add one more thing? Yeah, yeah one item in response to the Honorable Judge Walton's question is how does the pay rate affect the quality of the representation? And one thing that I've noticed is that in my district, a lot of the applicants that are both rejected and accepted tend to be newer attorneys with little to no federal experience, frankly. Uh, there's, there's, been, there's exceptions to that for sure, but I do think that the higher pay rate would cause more private federal practitioners to apply for panel work, which would help increase the quality. I mean, we could all learn from these people. We do learn from them. We see them in court. There was one year, however, where the economy was bad, where we got like th two or three of the top attorneys in the area applied. But with that year being an exception, I noticed that the applicants coming in are uh, often just state practitioners on that indigent defense panel seeking uh, to get some federal experience. Well, if I may break in, um, we are actually running ahead of schedule, which is amazing. So I have a few questions for you. Uh, this has been fairly powerful testimony. And I have a couple questions about the, the basis for your conclusions. So unlike some other witnesses uh, who have appeared, several of you have said, I'm not just testifying based on my own personal experience. I have spoken to my colleagues. I'm wondering if you can share with the committee roughly how many people have you spoken to that form the basis for the conclusion? So are we talking five to seven? Are we talking 10? Or is this impressionistic based on your experience in general? I can well, answer the question on, on my panel. I think there are 120 of us, and I would say that the comments about voucher cutting come from over 30% of the panel. Okay. It's something that's discussed all the time amongst ourselves whenever there is a CJA uh, conference of any kind, when we are at the end of the training sessions, that comes up, and it gets uh, very passionate. Okay, thank you. What I would say is um, some of the, my comments and testimony are certainly derived from my observations across time, 
but I have made several calls upon the panel at large through email solicitation for input. I've also, in personal conversations with, count, with different lawyers, made a request for input. I can't put a precise number to it, but I'd say well, it's substantial. I'd say we're upping to close to maybe 100 different lawyers who've okay. given me input. But I would also temper that with some lawyers gave me very specific, short answers. Other lawyers gave me long uh, commentaries. Some of those commentaries prompted me to pick up the phone and call for further clarification. So I feel that I have a lot of input, but I don't know that I could say I have a unanimous view from the, I don't think that our panel necessarily has a unanimous view on many issues. And so trying to synthesize it and present here is really what I'm hoping to do, but I feel like I'm calling upon what a lot of different people have said. Okay, thank you. Mr. Windsor, I believe you actually mentioned a number of people you had spoken to. What, what's the rough basis of, for the number? Well, Professor, I, I think there are two data sets here. There's the, okay. there's the recent history data set, which is admittedly small, I, but what we have uh, in the Central District. Probably the, one of the best things that we have implemented uh, in the panel is a listserv that every panel attorney's on. Uh, and it's been very helpful. Uh, there's a lot of help emails that get responded to and we all get to see the responses and we learn from that. Um, I sent a message two days ago over this listserv and I've received, uh, I actually received 18 responses and I've identified 12 as um, similar situations. The other responses were, I'm afraid this is going to happen to me. It hasn't happened yet. So short term, small data set. Long term, obviously I've been monitoring this listserv for a long time. I know many of these attorneys personally and so I've talked to them on that level. Um, now as far as numbers, I would say it's certainly not you, all of them, I haven't reached out to all of them. And some of them I've probably never talked to in my life. It's a, it's a big panel. But um, the, as far as losing the, the comments that I've made, the assertions that I've made that we are losing an entire generation of our best attorneys, that is based um, on conversations with, I would estimate, direct conversations with, I would estimate, about 20 attorneys that I know of. And my gleanings from years of emails um, and that are getting worse and worse. Uh, so for what it's worth, that would be it. I think data-wise, the people that you should talk to uh, are coming tomorrow. That would be um, the two CJA reps. Right. And they might be able to. No, I, I appreciate that. I'm just trying to get a sense of the basis for you, your testimony today. May I yes, please. Yeah. So I, I conducted uh, phone interviews of approximately six to seven people that I actually targeted because I know them to be opinionated. They, they're very vocal. And then, of course, I've been on the panel for eight years, and I, you know, it's Sacramento to me anyway feels like a small legal community. Right. I suppose everybody feels that way about their community. Everybody knows each other. So over the period of the eight years, you know, I have a, I have a finger on, the, on, on some of the issues. But to answer your question in terms of the reliability of the data, would about six to seven specific phone interviews. Okay, so let's flip this then. You've talked about voucher cutting, you've talked about delays, you've talked about a number of problems. The folks you've talked to, when they tell you the problems they've had, are they talking about a problem that is in, in your district that is, if you will, system-wide across the district? Or are they talking about problems that they're having with, if you will, an isolated judge or a particular clerk or something? Is this systemic? Or if we could fix a couple people, if you will, if the committee could, would this be fixed? Or could this be improved? It's definitely not all of the judges. There's no question about that. I'm sorry, it, I didn't hear it's, you. It is definitely not all of the judges. So, but I don't think that, other than a systemic fix, I don't think that you could do anything about it. I'm not sure how it would work in practice, and it, it might be very intrusive and offensive and, and, and backfire. But it's certainly not uh, I, I don't want to say that it's everybody. There are many, many judges who uh, support, fully support, funding the CJA panel. The rest of you? I'm not sure that I would 
um, be able to answer that question in a direct way because I think much of it depends upon who the individual is, whether it's specific to that individual in the particular case of the day that's the frustration, or whether I'm dealing with somebody who's more measured and contemplative and has a broader overview of the practice under the CJA. But then I've tried to account for that in my presentation here. I may have failed, but in the various inputs that I've received from the different council, again, knowing them and having interacted with them, some for many years and others not at all previously, I've tried to take into account that, who my source is. Let me give you a little bit of the context of why I'm asking this. And I speak entirely for myself here. And one of the advantages of being a reporter is you get to sit back and watch what's going on. Um, and some of you have said you've looked at the testimony and the hearings in the other cities. And it, so I, I look at, uh, say, a hearing in Birmingham where um, not a lot of complaints from the people who appeared before the, the committee. And yet if you look at the data, uh, not a lot of experts being or service providers being used in those districts. Um, the uh, the, the um, number of hours from the attorneys, not as high. We come out here to California, more experts and service providers being used, uh, more attorney time generally, and yet you all are saying problem, problem, problem. Is there something different about what's happening in the districts in California or Alaska, or is it that your experience is compared to a different legal market. What, what's going on here so the committee can understand why they're hearing from you on these issues? Um, I, can I start on that? I think with regard to the Central District of California, as I mentioned in my initial statements, I believe we are the district that invented the mega case. And one of the ramifications of that is what comes with the mega case are the mega attorney bills. And I think I, my sense, my, my belief, and actually, Professor, this is not really based on hard data, but I believe that um, what's happening is there are some judges within the system, maybe very high up in the system, who probably, I would assume, look at the Central District as the most expensive district. Uh, and we've got to do something about it. And that, you know, I'm imagining with what I can glean uh, is snowballing into this never-ending stream of procedures that are not focused on high-quality representation. They are focused on one thing, uh, and that is reducing our vouchers. They've tried to talk to the U.S. Attorney's Office and say, will you please stop filing these? But, of course, the U.S. Attorney's Office is independent. They can't be told what to do by the judges. So I assume giving up on that, they've turned to us, that they, who they can tell what to do, and we're, we're getting this. That's, that's my theory. It is not based on data. But, but it's, a, it's a useful one. What about the rest of you? I think one of the things that has happened in our district is, again, with the advent of e-voucher, the judges have the ability to just go and look at individual uh, attorneys and see what they've uh, charged over the years. It doesn't necessarily take into account um, if you have a mega case where you might not bill for it. Uh, we don't have, uh, we generally bill at the end, although we can do interim vouchers. And again, because most of the judges that we have don't come from private practice, they just look at a number and they don't realize, um, as I think I put in my submission, they don't realize how much of that money we don't, we don't keep and how much goes to overhead and every other thing. So it looks to them like, wow, they're making more money than we are. So I think that's one thing. Secondly, we have a huge increase in mega cases in our district in, in San Diego as well. And it, I've had mega cases both when Federal Defenders of San Diego has been on those cases and when they have not. And there's a huge difference uh, in help. When Federal Defenders is on those cases, first of all, they are able to assign usually two, judges, two attorneys to work on those cases and sometimes reduce their caseload. They have excellent software programs and they help us to organize all of the discovery. Uh, some of the testimony that you heard earlier from the previous panel about how do we get CJA attorneys up to speed, I mean, I do have thoughts on that. Make the software available to us. Uh, the discounted rate is still high. Make the software available to us. We will go to training. We will learn. Uh, we want to. It makes our lives so much easier. But when Federal Defenders of San Diego is on those cases, they do some of that work for us, and it helps reduce costs, costs and it helps us provide better representation. But recently, 
Um, and I don't know whether it's nefarious or whether it's just a, a reality, but the U.S. Attorney's Office has been moving to recuse federal defenders in almost every single case. And some of the conflicts are actual, and some of them are really tenuous. Well, we might, if the case goes to trial, in rebuttal, call this witness who in 1992 was represented on a 1326 case right. by federal defenders. we got to kick them off. And there's no, the magistrate judges don't question the veracity of that statement. And so then, lo and behold, in all the mega cases I have right now, there's no federal defender attorney. And uh, it makes a difference. So those, those things impact as well. Thank you, Judge Cardone. Yeah, one other question. If it were up to me, I'd love getting out of the business of having to review vouchers. And assuming we make that recommendation, but Congress doesn't buy it, and they say, no, we're not letting you off the hook. Do you have any idea or any recommendations as to what we could, as an alternative, recommend or require or, or recommend be done in order to address the concerns that are being, uh, being expressed? I mean, I do. I, I think that if the judges are going to be involved, um, do they have to be the sole voice would be one question. It may be that Congress says, yes, we want those judges to do so. And if that's the case, then as I articulated in my opening statement, there has to be notice, an opportunity to be heard, and an opportunity to challenge the reduction to another body. There has to be due process. If they're going to make the judges continue to be involved, and that, I think, is not the best case scenario by any means, either for the judges or for us. But if that's going to be the case, I think the system already, already exists. And that system was described to you this morning. Uh, Peter Shaw, uh, the budgeting attorney from New York, those are workable systems. They may not be ideal, but they are workable systems because these are people that take oversight seriously. They don't just count beans. That's not oversight, okay? That's what's happening in the Central District. They look at quality. They determine who should stay on the panel. They make decisions about that. If somebody's not meeting the standard, they take care of it. That is the kind of oversight that we need. I mean, that's what we need. Every law firm, every organization really needs that kind of oversight. And it sounds to me, and certainly what I know about the appellate panel in the Ninth Circuit, and what I know about Peter Shaw and the respect that he commands, that system is very close to existing right now. And, and you already know about it. I'm going to agree completely with Mr. Windsor on that, because I have a great degree of respect for Commissioner Shaw. I think things function magnificently at the circuit under his uh, supervision. But I will go further and just say, if for some reason that's not an option that your committee considers op viable, I would suggest that at a minimum the presiding judge not be the decision maker. So whether you have each judge pair up with a different judge, whether it's a rotating judge who has voucher duty for one month out of however many cycles, whatever it is, have it be somebody other than the judge who is presiding over the case. In some instances, that's probably going to be to our disadvantage because there are some judges out there who and frankly... And how, how's that working in the Central District right now? Well, it's not happening in okay, the Central District that way. Uh, but that's why I'm saying I would suggest as, okay. a, as if we can't have something like one of the very proved models like Commissioner Shaw is demonstrating, then let's at least not stick with what we do have where it seems to be in one configuration or another, it is primarily the, the judge who has presided over the matter. There are a great degree of things, quite frankly, that I'm not going to be comfortable ever telling the judge who's presiding over the matter, even if it's to my personal financial detriment, because I don't want to, my, to be discussing my client in such a negative light. Because even if it's done after sentencing, my client may be back on a revocation. There may be any number of reasons why my client may still suffer at the hands of a judge who has seen some negative commentary in the billing that was necessary to explain, this is why I had to do this many meetings. This is why I had to go out at length and interview these particular witnesses. And frankly, it's not flattering to my client because it makes clear to the judge my client's been difficult. And that may result in my bill being cut, but worse, it may result in adverse treatment to my client later. So give it at least to somebody else, one of the other judges, one of your colleagues on the bench. 
if you have to do something, if we can't do something like Peter Shaw provides. All right. On behalf of, whoa, on behalf of all the committee, I want to thank all of you. It's been very, very helpful. I want to tell all of you that if um, the conversation we've had today has stimulated any thoughts, um, if there's more information you can provide, um, please, please feel free to do that. You, you met our staff um, and worked with our staff, so feel free to contact them and get it to them directly. Yeah, you can go to cjstudy.fd.org and get it to them. But we are really appreciative of any information you can get us because we're really trying to get all of the information we can get. Um, with that being said, once again, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it. And and uh, we'll adjourn until tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.